Welcome to Bloom Baptist Church Services. We're glad you're joining us. Whether it's for the first time, you missed us on Sunday, or you're returning to an old favorite. If you'd like to join us for a live Sunday morning service, you can find us at the address on the screen. The worship services are at 1045 a.m. and Sunday school is at 930 a.m. Stay connected with us through our website, bloombaptist.org, or on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you'd like to give to Bloom Baptist Church today, just head to bloombaptist.org slash giving and follow the instructions on the webpage. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that through the service you are about to watch, that Christ is magnified and that the Word encourages you, challenges you, and transforms you. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. The mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood Oh to grace how great a debtor daily i'm constrained to be let thy grace lord like a fetter find my wandering heart to thee Come to My heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Pierce my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I was an orphan lost at the fall, running away when I hear you call, but Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own, I had no right to draw near your throne, but Father, you loved me still. In love before you laid the world's foundation. So high above my station, I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. You left your home to seek out the lost, you knew the great and terrible cost. In Jesus, your face was set. 
I worked my fingers down to the bone, but nothing I did could ever atone. Jesus, you paid my debt. And by your blood I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. And you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night but spirit you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own head full of rocks a heart made of stone but spirit you moved in me and at your touch in my sleeping Spirit was awakened, and on my dark and heart the light of Christ has shown, calling to a kingdom that cannot be shaken, heaven sits in by grace and grace alone, so I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace and grace Well, good morning, church, and we're so thankful that you have uh, joined us here this morning. And I want to thank you for your faithfulness over these past, really, three, four months now that we have been uh, not doing church as usual, and uh, many of you have been faithful to watch online. Some of you have been able to come from time to time, and we're just thankful for you doing whatever it is that you can do. And I also want to thank you for your faithfulness to give. Uh, you have... Um, I've been faithful in that and have continued to give, whether it's online or by sending uh, checks in the mail. And we're just thankful for that. Our, our giving for June was a little bit ahead of where we needed to be. And uh, so we just want to thank you for uh, being faithful to attend, to watch, to give, and to do those things. Today, our series in the book of Judges brings us to the fifth cycle of rebellion, the results of rebellion, repentance, and rescue, and then the sad part of that cycle is that it is repeated seemingly over and over and over again. So in Judges chapter 10, verse 6, we read a sad, but really now in, in this book, an all too common uh, phrase that again the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. It's becoming a recurring theme in the book, and it's usually uh, it, it's usually coming right after a, a period of peace and prosperity. Think about this. If you go back to chapter 3, after Othniel, there was a period of peace for 40 years. There was, uh, uh, after Ehud, the, the left-handed judge, there, was, there were 80 years of peace and prosperity. And then after Deborah and again after Gideon that we talked about last week, there were 40 years of peace and prosperity. And it seems that every time the land experienced this, this period of good uh, where there was peace with their uh, neighbors, where there was prosperity in the land, uh, that it, it, it this didn't last. It, it became a, a time where they began to do what was evil in the Lord's sight. And I think the same is true today, that peace and prosperity often lead to rebellion. It's like the more that we prosper, the, the easier it is to begin to worship uh, the gift more than the giver of the gifts. And little by little, the blessing becomes more uh, of our focus. It, 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 it entails more of our time and takes more of our energy than uh, we give to the one who has blessed us with these good things. And after each judge died, and scripture often says soon after, that the nation repeated this cycle of rebellion. And so today we're going to be looking 
at uh, the fifth major judge. His name is Jephthah, okay, J-E-P-H-T-H. A H okay, and we're going to start looking today at uh, uh, Judges chapter ten, beginning at verse six, and it says that after the Israelites, excuse me, again the Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They served the images of Baal and Ashereth and the gods of Aram, Sidon, Moab, uh, uh, Am- Ammon, and Philistia. They abandoned the Lord and no longer served Him at all. You ought to circle. Those two words at all. So the Lord burned with anger against Israel, and he turned them over to the Philistines and the the Ammonites, who began to oppress them that year. For 18 years they oppressed all the Israelites east of the Jordan River uh, in the land of the uh, Amorites, that is Gilead. The Ammonites also crossed the west side to the west side of the Jordan and attacked Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. Ephraim. And the Israelites were in great distress. Finally, they called out to the Lord for help, saying, We have sinned against you because we have abandoned you as our God and have served the, uh, the images of Baal. And if you go back there in verse 10, you ought to underline the three words, we have sinned, because I think that's important here. Verse 11, the Lord replied, Did I not rescue you from the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, and the Philistines, the uh, S- uh, Sidonites, the Amalekites, and the Moabites? When they oppressed you, you cried out to me for help, and I rescued you. Yet you have abandoned me and served other gods. So I will not rescue you anymore. You ought to underline that phrase too. Uh, Go out and cry to the other gods that you have chosen. Let them rescue you in your hour of distress. But the Israelites pleaded with the Lord and said, We have sinned. Punish us as you see fit. Only rescue us today from our enemies. Then the Israelites put aside their foreign gods and served the Lord, and he was grieved by their misery. At that time, the army of Ammon had gathered for war and were camped in Gilead, and the people of Israel assembled and camped at Mizpah. The leaders of uh, of Gilead said to each other, whoever attacks the Ammonites first will become the ruler over all the people of Gilead. The first thing that we see here is an uncommon repentance, and it's revealed in verse, uh, verse number 10. And for the first time in Judges, we see the people taking responsibility for their own sin. It says that finally they cried out to the Lord for help. They said, we have sinned against you because we abandoned you as our God and have turned to the images of Baal. Uh, that word finally, it, it, it says that it had been 18 years that they had been oppressed by the Ammonites. And after 18 years, finally, finally, they come to the Lord and they repent. And then it's a little different than anything that we've seen in the book of Judges so far. They didn't cry out to the Lord. Last week we looked at how the, uh, the people in Gideon's time, they cried out to the Lord because of Midian. As if they were saying, all of our problems are caused by the Midianites. If we could just get, man, if we could just get rid of these Midianites, we'd be okay. But here, the people of Gilead, it says that they cried out to the Lord and they said, we have sinned. We have sinned. We have turned from you as our God and have turned to other God. There's a difference between being sorry because of judgment and being sorry because of sin. One means that we're sorry that we've sinned. We're sorry that we've turned from the Lord. The other essentially means we're sorry that we, well, that we're sorry that we got caught. We're sorry that things didn't turn out the way that we wanted it uh, to, to, to turn out. And so for the first time, I think we see true repentance. And uh, I call this point an uncommon repentance because in the book of Judges, it's uncommon that the people truly and literally took responsibility and said, man, it's on us, God. We have sinned against you. We have turned from you. So it's the first time that we see true repentance expressed through remorse for sins that they had committed. And true repentance always, always, always begins with us. Verses 11 uh, through 14, there's something that I find that's quite alarming uh, from the Lord. As you look there, 
when uh, the, the people cried out to the Lord, they repented, they said, we've sinned, they asked God to help them. He said, I rescued you from these seven other nations who oppressed you, but you haven't learned your lesson and you've continued to follow and worship other gods. And, and God essentially says, I'm not going to rescue you this time. You're on your own. In fact, he says, if you want to worship those gods and if you want to serve those other gods, go to them. Uh, ask them to save you and to rescue you from the, the problem that you're seeing. Well, the problem is those other gods couldn't because, you know, because of them, they were in the situation uh, that they were in. But God here says, I've had enough. I'm not going to rescue you anymore. And verse 15 is very important. And it's important not only for them then, but it's important for us today that they continue to plea and they continue to confess and they continue to ask God to rescue them from the Ammonites. They said, we have sinned. Punish us as you see fit. Only rescue us today from our enemies. And, I, and my question is, why would they uh, want God to punish them uh, over their enemies? Why would they want God's punishment over the punishment of their enemies? And I think the answer to that question is that they recognized the grace of God. They knew that God was a God of grace and mercy. And as they looked back over the history of their nation, they had seen over and over and over again where God had given them a second chance. And I'm thankful today that God is a God of mercy. He is a God of second chances and that he is a God of just amazing grace. And in verse 16, we see that, uh, that the, the, the people of Gilead were right. Uh, you notice that not only did they say, God, we're sorry because we have sinned, but they put aside their other gods, the foreign gods, and it says that they served God and that uh, God was grieved because of their misery. Our God is a merciful God. And we need to realize that repentance is more than feeling sorry for our sins. It, it involves changing the way that we view our sin. It, it involves changing our actions, the things that we do. And it involves pleading with God for His mercy. The second thing that we see in this passage, in this cycle, is an unlikely hero. Look at verse uh, chapter 12. Excuse me, chapter 11, verse 1. Now Jephthah of, of Gilead was a great warrior. He was the son of Gilead, but his mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also had several sons. And when these half-brothers grew up, they chased Jephthah off the land. You will not get any of our father's inheritance, they said, for you are the son of a prostitute. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he had a band of worthless rebels following him. About this time, the Ammonites began their war against Israel. And when the Ammonites attacked, the elders of Gilead sent for Jephthah in the land of Tob. The elders said, come and be our commander. Help us fight the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to them, aren't you the ones who hated me and drove me away from my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you're in trouble? Because we need you, the elders replied. If you lead us in battle against the Ammonites, we will make you ruler over all the people of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders, let me get this straight. If, you, if I come uh, with you and the Lord gives me victory over the Ammonites, you will really make me the ruler over all the people. The Lord is our witness, the elders replied. We promise to do whatever you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him their ruler and commander of the army. At Mizpah, in the presence of the Lord, Jephthah repeated what uh, had, he had said to the elders. I want you to note here that we, 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 uh, we don't see here this familiar statement that we've seen with all the other judges. In, in all the other judges up to this point, we see this statement that the Lord raised up a rescuer or the Lord raised up a, a judge. In chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord raised up Othniel. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 15, the Lord raised up Ehud. We see that the angel of the Lord last week appeared to Gideon. But for Jephthah, it was the elders of the land, the elders of Gideon. Uh, Gilead, And these were probably his brothers, the brothers that had run him off the land. These, that's probably who these elders were. And they came to him, and it was the elders or his brothers who said, Come and be our commander. 
Come and be our commander. And, and, and what is it that made Jephthah an unlikely hero? Well, the first, the first thing is he was the son of a prostitute, which says a lot about his father Gilead, uh, and perhaps more about Gilead than it really does about Jephthah. Uh, he was rejected by his family. They said to him, there will be no inheritance for you. You are the son of a prostitute, and we're not going to share our father's inheritance with you. Maybe because it brought embarrassment to their family, him even being there reminded them of the situation. So they chased him off, and he went to the land of Tob, and there he became the leader of what appears to be a band of thugs. Uh, the New Living Translation that I read from this morning said that they were worthless rebels. And so he began to be a leader uh, of this, this band. And we see very little in Jephthah's life th uh, that would indicate virtue or character or any kind of leadership ability. Uh, but I would have to say that certainly he learned something being the leader of a band of worthless rebels that we, he was able to, to, to draw on later as he led uh, Gilead and he led Israel against the Ammonites. His brothers were willing to take a chance on him. And when things got tough, they, they, uh, they went looking for Jephthah and they wanted to make him their commander. And I don't know if you're like me, when you read that or when you hear that, you think, man, what audacity. How, how audacious is it for them to come looking for the guy that wasn't good enough to be their brother and they, they ran him off, he's not getting an inheritance, you can't live here. But boy, when they needed someone to fight their battles, they went to him and said, will you fight our battles? And I don't know if you see that here, but there is just this, this kind of holy irony here. This is exactly what the nation of Israel had done to God. When times were good and things were going well, God, we don't need you. We're going to worship these other gods and we're going to do our own thing and we're going to do whatever makes us happy and whatever makes us feel good. But when things turned bad, they were saying, God, where are you at? God, would you come and fight our battles? And I think within this story, kind of the story within the story, is that we see uh, the elders of Gilead, literally, I believe, his brothers, uh, treating him like they had also uh, treated the Lord. So in verses um, uh, uh, 12 through uh, 28, really 28 to 29 there, Jephthah begins his interaction. He agrees to become the, the commander of the, of the, uh, uh, the people against the army of Ammon. And in verse 12, he begins his interaction with the king of Ammon. And he asks the question, why are you fighting against us? Well, the answer literally in short is you stole our land. And if you go to Numbers 21, you'll see the story there when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt and coming into the promised land. They were on the east side of Jordan. And Moses sent and asked uh, Edom and then later uh, Moab and asked their kings if, he would let, if they would let uh, the children of Israel pass through their land. And both Edom and, and Moab said, no, they're, you're not going to pass through our land. And so Moses and the children of Israel, uh, they had to go around and it, it, it added a lot of time and a lot of work to the journey. But the Amorites not only refused, but they uh, refused and said they didn't trust the Israelites, and then they attacked. And if you read that story, you realize that the Israelites won the battle, and they took the land. And so Jephthah says to the king of Ammon, you know, we won the land. The Lord get, has given it to us. And he asked the question, don't you keep what your God gives to you? Don't you keep the things that your God gives to you? Uh, we're going to do the same thing. God, we fought this battle. The Lord allowed us to win the battle. And because of that, the land is ours. And besides that, he says, it's been 300 years. For heaven's sakes, if you were going to do something, why have you waited 300 years to come back? And the simple answer to that question is, for the last 300 years, Ammon has not been strong enough to go against the Israelite, but now they see their chance. Now they see their opportunity, and uh, they're going to go in now because they are going to seize the opportunity. But in verse 28, the king of, uh, it says that the king of Ammon said, uh, or paid no attention to what Jephthah said. He just kind of let it go and swept it under the rug. He's hoping, I guess, that he would go away. He was hoping uh, that uh, Jephthah wouldn't come after him. And perhaps even in his mind, he thought that they were so much more powerful than the Israelites that there was nothing that Jephthah could do. And his uh, eyes and his mind was set on uh, ruling and oppressing the Israelite people. 
Look now at uh, ver- uh, chapter 11, verse 29. And what we see here is an unwise vow. And this is the part we always remember when we talk about Jephthah. It says, At that time the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he went throughout the land of Gilead and Manasseh, including Mizpah and Gilead. And from there he led an army against the Amorites. Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. And he said, if you give me victory over the Ammonites, I will give to the Lord whatever comes out of my house to meet me when I return in triumph. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. So Jephthah led his army against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave him victory. He crushed the Ammonites, devastating about 20 uh, cities from Aor uh, to the area near Mineth, and as far away as Abel, Karaman. In this way, Israel defeated the Ammonites. When Jephthah returned home to Mizpah, his daughter came out to meet him, playing on a tambourine and dancing with joy. She was his one and only child. You should underline that. And he had no other sons or daughters. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes in anguish. Oh, my daughter, he cried out. You have completely destroyed me. You have brought disaster for me, for I have made a vow to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. She said, Father, if you have made a vow to the Lord, you must do uh, to me whatever you have vowed, for the Lord has given you a great victory over your enemies, the Ammonites. But first let me go and do this one thing. Let me go up and roam in the hills and weep with my friends for two months because I will die a virgin. You may go, Jephthah said, and he, uh, and she, uh, he sent her away for two months. And she and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never have a child. When she returned home, her father kept the vow that he had made and she died a virgin. So it has become a custom in Israel for young Israelite women to go away four days each year to lament the fate of Jephthah's daughter. What made Jephthah's vow an unwise choice? What made it an unwise vow? Well, first of all, it it doesn't seem to me that he needed this vow from the Lord to win the battle. If you go back to verse 29, it says that the Spirit of the Lord had come upon him. And even last week when we were looking at Gideon, it said that the Lord took possession of Gideon. And Gideon didn't make any vows. He laid out some fleeces and so forth. But this is the first time that we see someone in Judges, at least, making this kind of vow to the Lord. It seems like God was ready to give them the victory anyway without this vow. In fact, it says in Proverbs 20, verse 25, that it is a trap to dedicate something rashly and only discover later that one's uh, uh, vow. Let me, it, it is a trap to dedicate something rashly and only later discover one's vow or consider one's vow. And what Proverbs was saying, what Solomon was saying is, don't make rash promises. Don't make rash vows. Don't even make rash decisions. We, we've all know the saying that says, be careful what you ask for because you may, you may just get it. And, and, and that seems to be what Solomon is saying. Be careful what you vow to the Lord because you may get it. So in verse 30 and 31, here's what, here's what Jephthah said. He said, if you give me the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of, uh, from the doors of my house when, uh, to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's and I will give it up for a burnt offering. In verse 34, we learn that this this girl was Jephthah's only daughter. In fact, it was his only child, son or daughter, and that's who came out of the house. And if you go down to verse 39, it says that Jephthah kept his promise. And so we are left to wonder, what did Jephthah really do uh, with his his daughter. Did, did he offer this daughter as a burnt offering before the Lord? Well, let's think about that for a minute. And there's many people who believe that he did, that he offered her as a, a burnt offering to the Lord. I, I do have a problem with that. And one of the problems that I have with that is in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, uh, offering of a child or a human sacrifice goes against everything in God's 
character. In fact, he says there in the law, uh, uh, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that we should never, ever, that the children of Israel should have never offered a human being, child or adult, as a uh, sacrifice. In fact, the idea of even offering a human sacrifice to the gods is more in line with the pagan worship of the Canaanite people for their gods than it is uh, for the one true God. And so perhaps Jephthah was attempting to serve God in the ways and in the patterns that he had served the other gods. I think there is another option, and I think it's a good option. In fact, this is probably where I would have to say that I land, because the, in the original Hebrew language, verse 31 could read that Jephthah's, um, uh, that his vow to the Lord was that whatever comes out of the doors from my house when I return in peace from the Ammonites will be the Lord. And instead of the word and, the, the Hebrew word could be or. It could be interpreted to our word or. So it could say whatever comes out, I will, it will belong to the Lord or I will offer it as a burnt sacrifice. So in this case, the girl uh, came out and we would, we would um, describe her as being offered uh, in service to the Lord much like uh, Samuel was. You remember that Hannah uh, was, was childless and she was at the temple and she was praying and her prayer was, God, if you'll give me a son, that I will give him back to you. And when Samuel was 12, 12 years old, Hannah took him uh, to Eli in the temple and offered him there. And he literally uh, stayed there in the temple from that day uh, going forward. We have to ask ourselves the question also, uh, that Jephthah had said that whatever comes out of my house, the first thing out of the door, I'm going to offer that. What if that had been something that in the law had been considered, um, you know, an, an unclean offering that wasn't to be offered as a sacrifice uh, to the Lord? And so uh, one of the ways that we can look, is, look at this is that this young girl was dedicated to the Lord in his service and that she would remain unmarried and childless for the rest of her life. So for this girl, it meant that she would remain unmarried, that she would remain a virgin, that she wouldn't have children. And that would fulfill what it says here when she lamented the fact that she would die a virgin. But remembering also for Jephthah that this was not only his only daughter, it was his only child. For him, it meant that his legacy was going to come to an end. This, this story just really looks a lot like Abraham taking Isaac um, uh, to the mountain and offering him as a sacrifice. And you remember that the, before he lowered the knife that God provided uh, the ram. And because of Abraham's faithfulness, uh, he, his, his legacy lives on even today. And we know very little about Jephthah other than this story here in the Bible. He's, he's obviously he's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, the Hall of Fame of Faith. Uh, uh, but, but what we see here is that either way that this turned out, whether he offered his daughter as a burnt offering, a burnt sacrifice, or if she remained uh, unmarried and a virgin for her entire life, Jephthah's legacy, his family line ended right there. So what is it that the Lord really wants from his people? King David, in writing um, Psalm 51, the psalm where he's kind of repenting of his sins and asking the Lord to forgive him after his adultery with Bathsheba, he wrote, you do not delight in burnt offerings or I would bring it. And really what David was saying was, man, it would be easy to come and bring a burnt offering and to bring a sacrifice to the Lord. But he says, you don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. He says, my sacrifice, O Lord, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, Lord, you will not despise. What is it that David was realizing? Well, he's realizing that the, what God really wants from us when we've sinned is a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. That word contrite literally means remorseful, but it is remorseful to the point that we're willing to do something about it. Uh, so he, you know, David's saying, God, you want us to be brokenhearted to the point where we're willing to do something about the condition that we're in. And so the Lord desires our repentance more than our vows. A vow indicates that we have something to offer uh, to the Lord more than he already has. Well, he has everything. There's nothing that we have that the Lord needs. So repentance indicates there's a change in our life. Not only that we're sorry for our sin, and not only that we're sorry that we got caught, but we're sorry to the point that we're willing to do something about it and make a change in our life. We've seen the people in chapter 10 
that they owned the problem. They said, Father, we have sinned. God, we have sinned against you. In fact, they did that two times. They, the first time they, they came and they confessed their sin, they owned the sin, and the Lord said, I've done all of this for you, but no more. I won't rescue you. But they continued uh, to plead with God and to confess their sins and to own the sin and say that we have sinned. And it also says that they put aside their other gods and they served the Lord and Him only. You see, Repentance is an action, and for them the action was to put aside those gods and to serve the Lord and the Lord only. And so they asked the Lord to forgive them and to rescue them uh, from their enemy, the Ammonites. Because we have sinned, like the people of Israel, we need a rescuer. And the good news is this, that Jesus saves. And if you are watching this today and have never asked Jesus to save you, to rescue you from your sins. I wonder if you would do that uh, today. Uh, The Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that the wages of our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So today would you, uh, just in a spirit of repentance, confess your sins to the Lord, admitting that you're a sinner, that you need help, that you can't save yourself. Uh, Would you today ask God to forgive you? See, this is the turning, turning from going my way, turning from going your way, and asking the Lord to be the leader of your life. Literally what the word Lord means is leader. To ask him to be the leader of your life. And the great news is that God still saves. He is still a merciful and a gracious God. And his grace is amazing. And he is willing not only to forgive, but to give everlasting life. I wonder if you would do that even today. Once again, we see that God also uses ordinary people to accomplish his plan. Jephthah had nothing going for him that indicated uh, virtue, character, or leadership. He was the son of a prostitute. He was the leader of a band of thugs, and yet God used him. And God wants to use me and you as well. And what that entails is that we are surrendered to him, and we are following him, and we are willing to do the things that he asks us to do. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this story. It's a bit confusing. Uh, And while we don't know the ending of the story, that's not even the important part. The important part is that when we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if there's one watching today that's never never done that, they've never accepted Christ, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. Father, for those who are believers and many maybe who have been saved for a long time, but, um, but in our lives we began to worship the, the blessing more than the blesser. And Father, I pray that you would forgive us of that. And I pray that you would help us to understand that you use ordinary people to, ex- to accomplish your extraordinary plan. And I pray that we would be uh, bro- of broken spirit and of a broken and contrite heart over our sins and that we're willing to follow you who have given everything to us so that we could know Uh, salvation so that we could know everlasting life bless the people that are watching this morning bless the people that are gathered this morning i pray that as a church you would use us in a great way we give you thanks and praise in the name of jesus amen thank you for joining us today if you made a decision to respond to the risen christ today need prayer or just have questions please send us an email at info at bloombaptist.org or call the number on the screen Don't forget to stay connected with us via our website or Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you decided to give to Bloom Baptist today, just head to bloombaptist.org slash giving and follow the instructions on the screen. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.